So happy Solidarity Day, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, you, you are all so, so welcome. And just before I say anything else, I just want you to take just one minute just to quickly check in with yourself and to arrive, because you're here for a reason. We need you all here. So just check in with yourself. Why are you here? Make sure you're truly here, and then I'll open the summit properly. So now that you're here, um, we're all responding to a call and a need to harness our collective intelligence. And Prue and Maddie and I, who've been putting out that call, have been staggered by the level of the response. So I want to say thank you to everybody who's contributing to the programme, everybody who has supported us financially to make this possible, everybody who's volunteered time, effort, talent, brilliance and everybody who is here just because you're here, because of the fact that you care. Thank you for coming, and you are an indivisible part of these two days. Um, so just know that. Um, we want, although there's a paradox in what I'm about to say, we want this to be a space for us to pause and to reflect. The paradox is obviously that this is a very busy program, and you might feel insanely pressured to do everything. Um, my urge is that you just look after yourselves, look out for each other. There's a band of amazing volunteers around. Um, I want to say specifically thank you to Indigo volunteers who've actually helped us throughout this to basically provide back, back office support and recruit volunteers. They're a lovely bunch of people and they're on hand should you need anything during these two days. Um, it's really important to us that because we put out this call to you and you've responded loud and clear that we really hear you, okay? So there are various different op opportunities for you to tell us what you think, how you feel, what you need. In the marketplace, which is through towards the cafe, there's an, a beautiful creative space where you can go and give feedback on lots of different things. We will have an online survey. Um, we've got a team of facilitators who I'll be introducing soon who will be harvesting throughout the time that we're together your thoughts your feelings your intentions one of the things we really want to know is what we all collectively need to be doing together going forward because the situation as we all know is getting worse in terms of the pressure um, from a hostile environment um, we've also got a lot of holistic and therapeutic support here so i also want to thank the people who are bringing that and to say that at any time, should you need that kind of support, it's available. Um, thank you for um, everybody who is here um, bringing what you bring. I just want to say one other thing. There's, from here on in, there is no right way of doing things at all. Everything is welcome. Mistakes are going to happen. We're going to probably lose some of our timing, etc. So just please just bear with us, but also just know that any mistakes that are happening, they're all part of what's supposed to be happening as we learn together how to, how to be a swarm, which is what I think we're becoming. Um, and so I look forward to hearing and being with you all. Um, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to the facilitation team, but before that happens, I'd love to introduce uh, Alf Dubs to come and speak. Um, he needs no introduction. Um, he's a hero for many for all the work that he's done, and he's going to speak for a few minutes. And then um, we're going to also introduce um, Kevin Bonavia from Lewisham Council, who's also a shadow cabinet uh, member dealing with refugees and democracy um, and accountability. So we've got these two brilliant people to help us to open today and to share with you why this is so important. So first, after us. Good morning and thank you very much for inviting me and congratulations to the organisers. This is a terrific event, absolutely terrific. I'm going to tell people who are back at Westminster what's going on here. I mean, fantastic, so congratulations to everybody. Look, I'm going to say a bit about what's been happening about this family reunion stuff because it's, it's had a bit of publicity. Uh, I'm as upset and taken aback by what's happened and so I'll give you a little bit of, of the inside story, if I, if I may, and then I'll talk about one or two other wider things. <coughs> okay. So, in 
there is something called it's 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 a to be talking about an EU treaty today is quite quite awesome as well or, or, or un underwhelming. The, 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 well, either way, look, guy, it's a disaster what's happening tonight. But, um, there's something called the Dublin Treaty, and the Dublin Treaty you probably know this basically said a bit of it said that a, a child in one EU country could apply and have the right to join relatives in another. And we were worried that that brought several hundred uh, young people to the, this country, people got to Calais and the Greek islands and so on. And um, we were worried that would all come to a halt when we left the EU. So the amendment I put down in the 20, to a bill in 2018 was to say that the government should negotiate to continue that particular process. It had a big majority in the Lords and the government accepted it in the Commons. And we thought, well and good, all we have to do is to make sure they negotiate and get it done. And then, just before Christmas, they published this latest bill, it's not an act, and they deleted all that. And this is astonishing. Why are they deleting it? So uh, I put down an amendment, and on one, uh, one occasion I was quite astonished. I was asked to meet three government ministers and seven officials, including one from number 10. So there were 10 people, 10 to 1. I thought that was fair odds. And, <laughs> and, and anyway, and, and, and I said, why are you doing this, for heaven's sake? And they said, well, we feel, we feel, first of all, they said we want flexibility in the negotiations. So I said, you're going to barter, barter the right of kids against something else. You're going to use them as a bargaining chip. Well, well not quite that. Uh, and then they said, well, we don't, um, we feel it shouldn't have been in that particular act of parliament in 2018. So I said, well, it's, it's there. Well, what, well, we think it should be somewhere else. So I said, where? They said, well, there's an immigration bill coming. So I said, well, you know, we've got something now. We don't know what's going to happen with the immigration, but it isn't even there yet. And they said, it doesn't have to be in a bill at all. So I said, wait a minute. Well, don't you believe us, said these three ministers. So I looked at them, well, what do you say? <laughs> so I looked them in the eye, and I say, I believe you, but I don't believe the government. And what else could I say? I was being very tactful. I was, I was in my best behavior, you see? <laughs> and, 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 I was quite shocked. Anyway, we, 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 we got a big majority in the Lords, and it went to the Commons, and they, and, they, and they voted it down. And nobody was affected at all. We were really disappointed. We thought, you know, we said, we said, look, this is fundamental. This is about the right of kids to join members of their family. I mean, these young people, as you will know, they've come halfway across the world, some of them, or long journeys, and quite a few of them, in the hope they can join parents, uncles, aunts, or, or siblings. You know, what is more reasonable than that? And before Christmas, I mean, there's one bishop, and look, I'm a humanist, but there's a bishop who said, you know, this is hardly the time when a refugee was fleeing in, in the Holy Land, you know, 2,000 years ago. This is hardly the time to be kicking, kicking refugee kids in, in the teeth. And that is what the government have done. And people say, why are they doing it? Well, I'm, I'm asked why they're doing it. And, and they gave me all these different reasons. This is, as I said, the wrong bill and this, that, and the other. And uh, I said, well, oh, I, I said to other people, look, why behave like you're mean and nasty if you claim you're not mean and nasty? You know, there's no evidence you're going to do the right thing. And I said, well, what we've committed to is a minister will make a statement in two months' time. So I said, you're bartering, you're giving me that. A minister making a statement to Parliament in two months' time instead of something tangible that's in the 2018 Act of Parliament. Anyway, so, anyway, it got back to the Lords and we weren't sure we could do it again, so I asked for some undertakings. And really, uh, I, I'm shocked by it. I understand that since Boris Johnson took over, there's been a much, much more hard line coming now. But I'll tell you something interesting. Three government ministers came to me and said they agree with me and they don't agree with the government. So I said, why don't you say so publicly? And they said, it's above my pay scale. Anyway, uh, but, you know, and a lot of toys have come, even some in the Commons, and they said they agree with me, and they don't understand why the government are doing it. So it, it's very odd politically. I suppose <coughs> the, the disappointing thing is that it's happened so soon after the government's been elected, and they're trying to show they're, 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 they're tough. But I, I, I think it's utterly, utterly, utterly depressing, okay? And, that's on, and then I said to the ministers again, when they said, don't you trust us? I said, look, when we had the amendment I put down in 2016 to enable children to come without family here, you know, you fought tooth and nail to stop that. 
You fought tooth and nail to stop it, and, and we got it through. Then you fought tooth and nail to stop the thing about family union being negotiated, and we won that one. And then you expect me to trust you. All the victories we've had have been fought for and done against the government's wishes, not, not, not with the consent of the government. So, you know, I just, I just think, well, I had to say this to them, and I've said it before, you know, we don't trust you. We don't trust you, because what you're doing is absolutely shabby. Uh, and I think a lot of your supporters don't, don't, don't trust you either. So I just say one or two other things very, very, very quickly. Um, can I just say, some of you have volunteered. How, how, many, have, how many of you have been to, been to the Calais or Lesbos or camps like that? Whoa, wow. Good gracious me. Well, look, can I say, can I pay a tribute to you? Because I think that is so impressive. I've met, I've been to Calais about four times. I've been to Lesbos and other places and I've been to Zatari, and I found one of the most impressive things being meeting people like you there, and what you've done. I want to pay a real tribute to you. Now, I say this to other audiences, because it's right that other people should know as well. I mean, there's so many of you here, I've been quite overwhelmed by that. But, but, but I think it's a terrific job you're doing, and it says a lot for this country that we have people who are willing to do that, and work in extremely difficult conditions. I've seen them you know, on short visits work in difficult conditions and support the most vulnerable fellow human beings who are refugee kids. So thank you very much indeed for what you're doing. I think it's absolutely terrific and I spread the word as well as I can and I will go on doing it. But my big, th big thanks to you. Now, um, the other issue is public opinion. Uh, I've said all along, we've got to keep public opinion on our side. Uh, it, it to, uh, and, and I'm always conscious that we have to put the arguments forward, certainly if I'm on the telly or somewhere, to say that it is the British public whose support we need. And I, I'm pretty well convinced that the majority of people in this country, if the argument about child refugees is put to them, they will say, yes, we can do more for child refugees. We've got to put the argument, and that some people are against, some people will say we don't want any, none, none of this, but we've got to put the argument, uh, and keep the public on our side. And that is one of the missions I have. Because if we have the public on our side, there is a chance we can get more done and we can push the government. If the public are not, are not with us, we're not going to make any progress. So, you know, I, I spent my... You're the public, but you're the, you're the, you're the con convinced public. You're, you're the converted public. You're, you're the, the best of the public. But uh, there are people outside, and I, I'm conscious of the need to say this to them. And, 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 to, and, 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 and to push it. Now, the other thing is, of course, some of you, I'm sure you've been asked this many times before, but if you feel like putting pen, first of all, um, where's Kevin? Lewis and Council are doing a great job, okay? I have to say, it's odd being here, because I used to be a junior employee of Lewis and Council many, many years ago. I used to work in Catford, and I find it quite, quite odd coming back here in a, in, a, in a different capacity. But Lewis and Council, not because I worked for them so many years ago, but um, uh, Lewis and Council are doing a great job on this. And my message was this, could you, if you have an MP who's a government supporter, uh, could you, well any of them actually, because it's good that they should be reinforced, is just to say to them, would they please support child refugees? Or refugees generally, but would they please support child refugees and, and family? And if you would like to put pen to paper to your M MPs, some of you might actually have a Tory MP, I don't know how far you've come, but, uh, uh, so, well, uh, you know, it's, it's not funny having a Tory MP. <laughs> Are you like that? But, uh, uh, you know, if you would, and also get on to your local council. Now, look, if they're doing well, pat them on the back and say, "Great job you're doing," and let people know that the council's doing a great job. It's not easy. There is resistance from some quarters, so, and, and of course, if you if you come from another council, anybody here from Bromley? No. Okay, I was going to say have a go at them, <laughs> but they're not doing very well anyway um, on this issue. But look. If, if the MP is sympathetic, you say, great, you're doing it. And, and if, the, if the council is sympathetic, then, 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 then that is a great thing. Could I just say, just in a slightly wider sense, I, I, I've been to, I was in Calais uh, I went before the jungle was pulled down, and you'll, you'll most of you know this, but what I found very shocking was in that, sh in that shopping street they had in the middle before most of the jungle was pulled down, um, they had a display of tear gas canisters and rubber bullets. I mean, did, any see, did any of you see those, or did you go after them? Anyway, I found that shocking. I said, what are they doing there? And people said, well, what happened was the previous French government was worried about the National Front being quite strong in the Calais area. And to clear the first half of the camp, which happened by the time I got there, uh, they said they were using tear gas and rubber bullets to shift them, 
Chips to refugees. I said, they're refugees. How can you use tear gas canisters and rubber bullets on refugees? And they said, well, the French government's trying to prove they could be tough. And I said, well, you don't defeat the National Front by behaving like the National Front. And I found that very shocking. Anyway, I went on other occasions and some wonderful, um, there was one, you probably know, Liz Clegg, who was actually older than most of the volunteers, who ran a mother and child unit. Uh, and she came, she's a firefighter from Birmingham. And she was absolutely, absolutely terrific. And she's still working with, the, with refugees in Birmingham. And she's still campaigning on behalf of refugees. But she was older than most of the volunteers. But fantastic, fantastic what, 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 what she'd done. And in a, just in a wider sense, before I finish, I'll say this. Um, you know, these expressions about hostile environment, they are shocking. You know, it is shocking that we should be so hostile to people who, who have come from elsewhere, who are the other. Uh, it, it doesn't, it isn't right, and it is not good for this country, uh, and I, I think it depresses me. I think in a wider sense, I think Europe, we should all share responsibility. You know, the Germans have done a pretty good job, uh, other countries have done a, a very, a, a very Disappointing job. We're, so we've done a bit, but we, we could do we could do much more. Uh, I just I just think that is um, it is depressing because if you go, uh, some of you have been, been to Lesbos or the Greek islands. Any of you has well, you know. Well, I mean, I was in Moria. I found that utterly, utterly shocking. And the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières in Athens said to me, you know, this camp in Moria, the big camp, and there's an overflow next to it, the olive tree or something. Um, uh, they, they said this is, there's no security and at night there are sexual assaults on children and boys get raped in those camps uh, and it is dreadful and there's very little hope and I have to say it's this lack of hope and I'll finish on this. I went to Zatari, now Zatari in Jordan is, is physically better because it's got, um, you know, it's got water and sanitation and recycling and all that sort of stuff but um, there's still I was talking to a Syrian boy, and he'd had an education in the camp. You know, physically, the camp there is much better than Calais. Where Calais is just sleeping under the trees, and I was tarpaulins over them. Uh, and um, I said to him, what are you going to do now? He said, well, I finished my education in the camp. I can't get a job in the camp. I can't get a job outside the camp. What do I do? And it's this lack of hope. And I think one of the things we have as a responsibility is to try and give people hope, because people can put up I believe, in difficult physical conditions if there is some hope. But where there is no hope, it is utterly, utterly depressing. And of course we know, we know that, um, that every time we close the legal path to safety for refugees, then the traffickers have a field day, people do the dangerous journey across the channel on the back of a lorry or, or, or in these unsafe little dinghies, and, and, and the traffickers have a great time of it. And that, that is so, so depressing, which is why we argue there should be legal routes to safety. Finally, can I say this? I came as a child refugee myself to this country um, as a six-year-old. Uh, and, you know, I, although I don't believe the argument for refugees should be based upon the personal experience of the person putting it forward, nevertheless, I'm obviously quite emotionally involved. But this country gave me a fantastic welcome and fantastic opportunities. And I would like to feel that the refugees, particularly the child refugees, coming here today get the same warm welcome and opportunities that I had when I came. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Kevin Bonavia um, from the Ocean Council. Um, thank you, and I want to add my own welcome to all of you uh, coming to Lewisham today. Um, it is so heartwarming on a day when we, it's a very sad day for many of us, um, when it looks like our country's turning its back on the rest of Europe, that we are not turning our back. We are opening our hands and keeping them open to people from all over the world um, who need uh, safety and sanctuary. And. I want to say a little bit about our experience in Lewisham, as, uh, on, about our journey on becoming what we hope will be a genuine borough of sanctuary. Um, but firstly, um, I just want to add my own thanks to Alf here, um, who really um, is a living legend. He has worked all his life um, for other people who've been through his own predicament and even worse. 
uh, and you know, without people like Alf leading the cause, we would not have achieved um, so much. And we in Lewisham, we've we've been on campaigns with Alf and Safe Passage and Citizens UK. Uh, and I just remember um, a couple of years ago the Alf, the, Alf, uh, the Dubs Amendment, which Alf talked about, um, and why um, the fight for legal rights is so important. Because after that amendment went through in 2016, in early 2017, Al, um, Am Amber Rudd, the then Home Secretary, got up in the House of Commons and said, oh yes, yeah, we did make this promise about 3,000 child refugees, um, but um, councils are just not able to take them in. They're not, taking, not giving places uh, to, to um, the child refugees. And I was incensed because for several months, ever since the, jung uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Calais jungle camp closed in, in October 2016, we as a council have been offering the Home Office 24 places and we hadn't even received one. So that was at best a misrepresentation and at worst an outright lie. And so ever since then, we've been campaigning because you have to campaign for legal rights. You can't rely on promises. They're not good enough, sadly. We need, we need rights enshrined in law, and we will carry on doing that going forward. But locally, uh, in all our communities, we need to work together. It's public services, um, volunteer groups, uh, and individuals themselves to provide a genuine sanctuary for people who are fleeing elsewhere. Uh, and in Lewisham, we decided that we would go on a journey to become a bar of sanctuary. And we did that for two reasons. Um, one, a positive reason um, from our own community. There was a demand, there is a demand in our community here um, that we do more uh, for refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants generally. Um, one concrete example of that was, in fact, um, it's quite a sort of um, uh, ironic that it was on referendum day back in 2016 in pouring rain. I remember there was a march of Lewisham citizens, the branch, local branch of Citizens UK, coming up to the council with a, a key, a key to a house that they had in Downham, which was ready to um, house a refugee family. And they were saying to us at the council, look, we have the homes. Can you, um, you know, provide us and support a family in that home? And so from that moment, we worked um, to make that happen. We then had a campaign to get 10 homes in 10 weeks. We got 11. And then after the local elections, we thought, right, we're going to go, we're going to have to push this. And we decided we have a program to, to bring in 100 refugee families to our borough. And you might think, well, it's a bit of an arbitrary figure. But actually, all it is, is that if you actually divvy up all the displaced refugees um, uh, from the Middle East that were coming to Europe, uh, in the last few years, if you actually put them in every local authority according to their population, then Lewisham should be taking between four and five hundred people. So that is why we went for hundred families. We are just doing our bit, and if every other local authority in Europe was doing that, then we could solve this this crisis. And I've got Teddy here, who's our where is your hand, Teddy? Um, who's our who oversees our refugee resettlement program, and so um, we're both here today to sort of learn from um, all of you about your experiences and, and tell you a bit about what we're doing our families and they are amazing I thought they would be uh, very you know I thought you know you might expect um, uh, sort of very uh, sort of withdrawn what you know suffering from trauma all that and that's true that does happen but many of the individuals in our families actually want to tell their stories because they actually want to you know um, encourage, as Al said, they want to encourage um, uh, people to, to come out and do their bit as well, and that's been amazing. Um, in Lewisham, we are challenging the hostile environment by saying, actually, we will adhere to the principles of sanctuary. And these principles we've picked up from the Cities of Sanctuary movement in the States, and, and of course we've got Cities of Sanctuary in the UK, I've got Ben Margolis, who's here, I think I saw him earlier, from there, and we work with Ben to help um, implement them in what we're doing here in Lewisham. And we helped set up the Lewisham Migration Forum, which is a group of uh, uh, organizations that work with migrants. Yes, Lewisham Mi Re Refugee and Migrants Network, Afrigi um, Act for Refugees in Lewisham, but also organizations like the Council um, and others that actually provide service to the general public, but it's how do we 
you know, look out for people who have come from elsewhere and actually come from a place of welcome and support rather than suspicion. So flipping the hostile environment on its head. Um, so we've all committed to the principal sanctuary and each of us are now uh, implementing them in our own services. So this year we're implementing a sanctuary strategy at the council. Um, and that to give you an example of that, we've already started, we've removed the embedded home office worker, some of you may be aware of that, um, where the home office has put in officials that um, oversee applications for, um, for, for emergency funds under no recourse public funds. Um, we've also brought in uh, free school meals uh, for all kids um, who are receiving emergency support on NRPF. Uh, and we're also, uh, as I was saying earlier, campaigning with groups like Safe Passage to actually make sure um, that we, as local authorities, do more uh, to bring in child refugees. So we're guaranteeing in Lewisham 100 uh, unaccompanied child um, refugees over the next 10 years, but we need the government to allow us to make that happen. So we've got to work together on, on that. Uh, so we're on a journey. Um, you know, we say, I say we want, we're becoming a borough of sanctuary, but we can't do it on our own. We have to work with our community. We have to work with people from you know, outside our areas as well and learn from them. And we have to work ultimately with the people that we are trying to help, and that's the people uh, who've come for our help, because they have the lived experience, um, they are the ones um, that will benefit, and they are you know, part of our community, and they contribute, they do not take, they contribute to our community, and we should be proud of them and celebrate them. So thank you for coming to Lewisham today. I'm really looking forward to meeting many of you and learning from you, um, so that we can all make what we do uh, far better and act in solidarity for the people that we are here about today. Thank you.